kill her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from one until three. Coming up this afternoon, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling rages at Scotland's new hate crime laws, daring officers to arrest her as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak backs Rowling's right to free speech. Meanwhile, the Princess of Wales was reportedly forced to reveal her cancer battle after Kensington Palace learned the news may be leaked. And despite the wettest 18 months on record, Britain still faces the prospect of a hosepipe ban and water shortages this summer. All of that's coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Divya Coley. Good afternoon. One child has died and two others have been injured in a school shooting in Finland. Police were called to a primary school located north of Helsinki to reports of another child opening fire on pupils. The suspect, a minor, was detained at the scene. Locals have been told to stay away from the area with an investigation underway. Rishi Sunak says Israel must immediately investigate the death of a British aid worker killed in a reported IDF airstrike in Gaza. In total, seven volunteers for the charity World Central Kitchen died in the attack. The others were Polish and Australian nationals. The Prime Minister says his thoughts are with the friends and families of the victims, while he also put pressure on Israel to explain why the tragedy occurred. They're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered. And it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that. And we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. The Israel Defence Force says it's reviewing the incident at the highest levels. The Labour Party claims conservative turmoil under Rishi Sunak has cost the taxpayer £8.2 billion and nearly a year in lost time. Labour's unveiled a website called The Cost of Chaos, which includes a bill calculating the cost of Tory by-elections, ministerial reshuffles and policy U-turns like scrapping the northern leg of HS2. Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, told us their calculations are cautious. It adds up to billions of pounds and it won't stop because they never stop. They're already manoeuvring around Rishi Sunak now. Uh, the leadership candidates are already plotting. And if the Tories were to win the next election, this kind of thing and this cost would all simply carry on. Donald Trump's avoided having his assets seized after posting a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case. The former U.S. president was at risk of having prime real estate like Trump Tower and Mar-a-Lago estate taken away from him. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. The number of patients waiting more than four weeks to see their doctor has risen by 30% to 17.6 million. The British Social Attitude Survey also found less than a quarter of people were satisfied with GP services, the lowest level recorded since 1983. GP services have come under growing strain, particularly in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic and ongoing NHS strike action. And an 80-year-old man has been arrested at Heathrow Airport after 27 years on the run. Richard Burrows was captured by police on Thursday after returning to the UK from Thailand. Extensive appeals were made by detectives to find Burrows after he failed to attend the start of his trial over alleged child sex offences at Chester Crown Court in 1997. He now faces 11 counts of indecent assault and two of a serious sexual offence. That's the latest weather time now with Isabel Lang.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. There will be some sunshine today, but top and tail of the country, there'll be some rain. We've got cold, uh, cold weather across eastern Scotland with outbreaks of rain this afternoon in the south. We've got this next veil of cloud heading in to bring some really soggy weather to end the day across much of southern England and south Wales. And you can see that also approaching uh, quite quickly this afternoon with freshening winds. In between, yes, some milder, sunnier spells, but there will be a few showers dotted about. Highest temperatures in the south and east at 13 to 17 degrees, just about possible. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, it stays wet and cold in the northeast, a bit of snow for Grampian. Across the south, we've got that wet weather continuing to push its way northwards across more central areas. It'll be heavy and persistent and get some tricky driving conditions as well. A lot of mist and murk over the hills as well, not particularly pleasant. It does turn a bit drier by the end of the night and quite mild for most, just a bit of frost in the far north of Scotland. And then for Wednesday, well, it's a pretty messy picture. Low pressure creeping into the Irish Sea, throwing that rain right across more central parts of the country, heavy and thundery across some parts of northern England through the afternoon. In the south, at least some brighter spells where it will feel warmest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including reports that over a third of Scottish police officers have still not been trained on their new hate crime lines, despite the regulations coming in yesterday. Also, reports that Princess Kate's hand was forced when it came to disclosing the news of her cancer treatment after it was threatened it was going to be leaked and the ludicrous news that Britain still faces a hosepipe ban and water shortages this summer, despite the wettest 18 months on record. And today we're joined in the studio by political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister. Thanks for coming along, Sam. Uh, well, let's talk about this hosepipe ban. Uh, my neighbour earlier this morning was saying that uh, he is deliberately going to flout it. He's going to make a point of sailing around with his hosepipe <laughs> like That's this. And I think, I think whilst we would never encourage anyone to uh, break the law, I think a lot of people will be feeling the same because all the water companies' bosses pay themselves millions of pounds a year uh, while losing billions of litres of water every single day due to leaks and pumping effluent uh, sewage into our rivers and the sea. Uh, these terrible companies expect us to uh, suffer a hosepipe ban. I think a lot of people this summer will say enough is enough, we're not doing it. I agree and I think the thing is there's a kind of basic social contract isn't there that actually um, most people will abide by the rules if they can see the point of the rules. What they don't do is abide by the rules when they can see the bosses just completely yeah. taking yeah. them for granted, putting up their bills, uh, failing to tackle leaks, uh, yet they have to see their garden go brown as the summer hots up. So I think your neighbour will be symptomatic of uh, many people advice. around this country, I think. Uh, not, not advising anyone to do that. You should, do, you should obey the law. But uh, I can understand that uh, sentiment. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this has been the wettest winter ever. These, we've just been through the wettest 18 months in British history. And, Alex, we're expected to not use our hoses on our back gardens. Right, it's, another, it's, like... it's another example of just the, the rubbish infrastructure we have in this country. You know, our sewage system dates back to the Victorian era. A lot of it doesn't work. You've got runoff from rainstorms mixing in with actual sewage and effluent being taken away, which is why it all ends up being pumped into rivers and the seas when we've had heavy downpours. We don't have good reservoirs. And it's often we're going, well, you know, we've got this old Victorian system. Wasn't it great? Well, yeah, it was great about 200 years ago do something about it i constantly feel that whoever is in government we're chasing a problem we're reacting to something when it gets too late rather than actually figuring out we need to do something about this now i mean it, it stands to reason we need more reservoirs there are some being projected to be uh, being built in the the northeast and, and and northwest and around the country but you know wh where are they these things should yeah. have been in place already well yeah. i mean 30 years without a new reservoir being built which is just insane and as you say the the, the point oh it's a victorian infrastructure well you know, in 100 years, are they still going to be saying, well, it's Victorian infrastructure. We have to do something about it. We mm. have to um, get on the front foot, not constantly be reacting. And we saw, you know, the state of our rivers, we saw at the weekend the, the boat race, uh, half the Cambridge team fell ill because the water was they so foul. They actually did fall ill. I noticed they don't go in the water. Yeah, no, I they, hadn't realised they, they actually yeah, got ill as a result. I think the three of the team were actually ill. 
Um, wow. And you know, if, if you if the water's so bad, your your team are dropping like flies. There's something wrong, yeah. isn't there? I mean, what I would like to say to uh, the audience, to everyone in Britain, is uh, you know, uh, despite the fact this is all down to the useless water companies and their useless fat cat bosses, uh, we still will suffer a water shortage. It's not our fault; it's their fault. Uh, so you have to be careful with this hose right. pipe, man. Observe it if you can. But I just want to put this in as a pop fact. Uh, ever since the Water Industry Act came in in 1991, no one has ever paid the £1,000 fine for flouting a hosepipe ban. You're just no going to leave that there. No <laughs> one has ever paid that, been forced to pay that money. Yeah. Once again, you must obey the hosepipe ban, but bear that in mind. Yeah, but I don't know. The government got a bit trigger happy with fixed penalty notices over COVID, so I wouldn't imagine that's going to stay the same forever. Also, you know, 1.5 billion litres of water is what is saved with a hosepipe ban, and we're losing 3 billion litres of water oh, yeah. every day yeah. with leaks. Yeah. It's just pointless. And you, and you can report a leak. There was a, a report near me. We reported the, the leak. It, it wasn't tackled. You know, you go on week in, week out seeing those leaks. People up and down the country have the same thing, where they report the leaks, nothing happens yeah. and then they're being That's told right. don't water your garden right. i must admit my faith in uh, tap water has really plummeted when i look i, I don't because i don't trust the water company yeah. on the leaks and i don't trust them on runoff and sewage into mm. rivers and waterways I, I just don't do tap water anymore because i i don't know for me it's it's too big a thing to go well you know they're probably doing that okay probably there's probably it, yeah. horrible <laughs> things floating around the tap water i'm like mm. when i lived in los angeles they got this sort of uh, problem with the water and it was that uh, your water all came out a bit kind of slightly brown and if you look closely it was lots and lots of little swimming things oh. which turned out to be small mollusks oh. and, uh, and the la <laughs> yeah. uh, the la water disgusting. company said no 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 it's perfectly safe you can yeah. drink it not many of us tried <laughs> right. I mean, all, all of our fish are high on cocaine and growing different genitals because they're being bombarded with all the sort of hormones and the contraceptive yeah. pill and a-class drugs don't tell the everyone works. they'll all want some of that water <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> On a, serious, <laughs> on a serious note, uh, we are asking, uh, until water companies get their act together, would you put a ban on hosepipe bans? Uh, let us know what you think. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Text us, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. Uh, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Uh, to our top story, though, now, and the Prime Minister has backed author J.K. Rowling in her criticism of new Scottish hate crime laws, saying people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts of biology. Uh, Sunak says the Tories will always protect free speech after the Harry Potter author challenged Scottish police to say her uh, to arrest her under the new legislation over online posts in which she called trans women men. The SNP's hate crime law, which creates a new crime of stirring up hatred relating to protected characteristics, has come up against heavy criticism amid fears it could be used for political purposes. Well, Scottish Minister Siobhan Brown says JK Rowling could be investigated by police for what she's done. But Education Secretary Jill Gillian Keegan said police should focus on fighting crime rather than policing people's thoughts and opinions. Our politi political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, is still with us. I mean, it's mad, isn't it? I never thought I would live to see the day that we essentially had North Korean authoritarian politics in this country, <laughs> where it's one thing to say if you're going around being a, a racist, yeah. you know, if you're going around being a misogynist, of course, misogyny not even That's, covered in this women legislation don't count. anyway. We don't count, Alex. You've got to learn. If you're going around and beating people up and nicking their money or preventing them going places, or, yeah. yeah, fine, okay, I can see why that you need legislation against that. But saying that man over there is a man, not a woman, you could go to prison for seven years in theory. Yeah. I, this is just balmy it's, and it's, dangerous. It's the most sinister piece of legislation in the UK I can remember uh, in, in living memory. And I think Humza Yusuf has repeatedly said that this will not be about criminalising women who say that trans woman is biologically a man. Um, but Siobhan Brown, as you just pointed out there, she let the cat out of the bag yesterday when she said actually misgendering could be an arrestable offence. And actually, do we trust oh the police to decide on these matters? No. We saw a police officer this weekend refuse to arrest somebody yeah. who was brandishing a SWAT sticker mm. because they said there could be context around that. That meant that it wasn't an arrestable <laughs> offence. Yeah. Now, 
if you've got police making those kind of decisions, why will you not have the reverse? Why will you not have police when they're being bombarded by trans extremists? Uh, why, why should we trust that they will not right. give in to pressure? The trans extremists are effectively going to be protected because they're the ones who shout about turfs, I yeah. want to murder them all, yeah. I want to rape them, I want to kill their offspring, they're evil. Uh, you know, but misogyny, like we said, not yeah. covered. It doesn't matter. And yet yeah. women who, when you look at the roll call of some of the men that JK Rowling listed, and yeah. said, these are men, essentially, a lot of them, you know, stuck a wig on after yeah. being kiddie fiddlers yeah. and said, I now want to go to women's prison. So women aren't allowed to stand up and say that man over there you know has come into the changing rooms yeah. and is being you know it's a yeah. wow they could get arrested yeah. for that and i don't understand that the world we live in where it's become an illegal offense to send a picture of your genitals airdrop to a telephone and yet if you're a man you could go into a changing room in scotland and get your tackle out and say but i'm a woman here's another thing yeah. i think uh, that someone in scotland could challenge this law uh, for being unlawful i don't yeah. think uh, that in a, 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 a right-thinking, responsible Western democracy, you can pass a law uh, which uh, uh, d directly contradicts the truth. Mm. They are, they've passed a law to say that when you see a trans woman, you have to say, you are biologically a woman. That is not true. No. Not true. How can you have a law to enforce a lie? I think this law is unlawful. I think that's probably a very fair assessment. And it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because actually it's obviously got through the Scottish system. It was supported, obviously, Scotland with the uh, Greens and the Labour Party. It, it kind of sailed through up there without real scrutiny. But yeah. it has taken years for them to actually put it into force. This, this passed a while ago. And it's clear because it took so long to actually put it into force, that there are great complications with this, yes. not least the fact that you are ask, asking police officers to make judgments about thought crimes. Mm. And actually, most people just want the police to police burglaries, to police car crime, to police yeah. uh, sexual uh, offences. Uh, and we know that the rates for prosecutions are so incredibly low that it's a free-for-all for many mm. criminals, really. And yet, what do they do? They turn their attention to the easy thing, which is attacking women. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> For yeah, policing yeah. women, for just trying to protect, protect their own rights. Yeah. And I think it's a really sad indictment of what's happening in this country. By the way, by the way also, this is the thing I don't like. I mean, it's not just the, 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 the uh, trans issue. It's this sort of criminalisation of hatred. Yeah. You know, the, it's against the law to stir up hatred. Uh, well, you know, as I said earlier, I hate lots of things. Yeah. You know, it's one of my favourite emotions. Why are they making it illegal? Suppose I want to stir, I don't know, stir up hatred about gang kids robbing grandmothers. That would be all right to stir up hatred I about, think, wouldn't it? Just don't move to Scotland, Kevin, because I think you'd be in trouble. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, they'll lock you up. It's, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. I think uh, former call centre worker Hamza Yusa mm. does not have the intellect to deal no, with this situation. The, the, this is outrageous. This is the problem we're getting across the West with the sort of big push for yeah. a minority of leftists, yeah. right, who seem to shout the loudest and get their policies through Parliament. I don't know who is ordained and sitting on high, suddenly moralising over these yeah. things, saying, oh, well, we've got to bang on constantly about trans rights when fewer than 1% of the population have gender dysphoria. Even fewer than 0.1%, yeah. I think, technically. Though. It's really low. Um, but no, we're going to keep doing this. We're also going to hold big placards going, refugees welcome. Nobody ever looks at what's going to happen as a net result of this. And what's happening, as far as I can tell, is it's especially making life for women difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's women who are facing the brunt of situations where men from other cultures are coming yeah. over here with their the medieval... Way, when you say women... You mean people, people with cervixes? Right? I mean, people with cervixes. It's women, on, who, get your terms it's right. women who bear the brunt as well for all this trans legislation. It's women who are being silenced. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with it now. For me, I don't care how politically correct I am. The safety and respect of women in the 21st century is far more important than hurty words. So let's make no mistake that this new hate crime law in Scotland is deeply sexist, isn't it? It is deeply sexist, but also I think it's also very uh, anti-working class because in the guidance that the police put out, it's, it was very clear that they were suggesting that the people that might be the most uh, prolific offenders in this thought crime mm. uh, world were white working class men, which is just astonishing. And you've got to think, if this is being applied fairly, will it be policing other cultures? Uh, will it be policing um, religious leaders who are um, 
anti-homosexuality, for example, which we know is uh, a thing in some faiths, uh, will, will it be applied to them equally? Well, it'll be interesting to see, because I, I think it feels like it's being targeted at a very particular part of the community, mm. and that is women who object to trans extremists and white working class men who perhaps don't have the right politically correct views. Let's just say, uh, we just mentioned earlier that a third of Scottish coppers say they've had no instruction on this at all. So they'll, they'll be wading around in the dark. They don't know what they're doing. But uh, just in case, uh, this is uh, the definition of this new law. A person commits an offence if they communicate material or behave in a manner that a reasonable person would consider to be threatening or well, abusive. Well, what's a with, reasonable person? Well, hang on, I'm saying with the intention of stirring up hatred based on protective characteristics. Look, I mean, it's I don't want to be abusive to people, but it's not against the law no. to be abusive. If I turn around to him, not that I ever would to Sam, of course, but if I turn around and say, you know, you're ugly and I hate you, that, that can't be against the law. <laughs> I'd go and have a little yeah, sock. Yeah. It's not like true, it of course, it. Sam. It's not true. <laughs> Bless you. you. Know. Um, but I think that's the point, isn't it? And actually, this is about... Um, no, no group in society should be protected from mockery. You know, this is written, and the whole point is that we are all supposed to be treated equally, and that means mm -hmm. also being equally uh, open to being mocked and to being criticised yeah. and to being, um, you know, attacked if it is. Good point kind of, you yeah. made, by the way, uh, Alex, not, not about, about what, you know, th this way. is so full of grey areas. I mean, that a reasonable what person is a reasonable would person? consider to be threatened. Well, I think what a reasonable is a reason person would see yeah. Derek yeah. with his lunchbox probably <laughs> isn't a woman. Yeah. That's what a reasonable person would say. <laughs> Sorry, mate, you seem to have a, <laughs> the socks so stuffed down the front of your pantyhose. Yeah. You're probably you're, not a woman. Yeah, <laughs> you're a bloke in a dress, aren't you? Uh, I say as a reasonable person. No one ever called me reasonable, by the way. Uh, now, uh, joining us live, though, uh, on this issue from Edinburgh, the city in question, mm. is women's rights activist Elaine Miller. Mm. Uh, thanks for joining us, Elaine. Uh, as I say, Edinburgh, uh, very much in the news right now because J.K. Rowling is abroad at the moment, but she says when she returns, she's challenged the police to arrest her uh, because uh, she will not call a trans woman a woman. Uh, what do you feel? I mean, there are so many aspects of this absurd, draconian law to discuss. But what do you feel about living in a country where your leaders, uh, the SNP, have just passed a law uh, that makes it illegal for you to state the truth? That is, that a, wo a trans woman is not a woman. Uh, that's illegal. If you say a trans woman is not a woman in your country now, that is against the law. This is uh, th through the looking glass Alice in Wonderland stuff, isn't it? It's baffling. It's completely baffling about why elected representatives would make a decision like this when they have had opportunities to have advice that would fit in with law and common sense and have chosen to ignore it. Um, I don't think that they've thought it through at all and I don't think that they've understood the consequences of this because if I'm not allowed to say that somebody that's male and has a gender difference, you know, believes themselves to be a woman, um, maintains their same sex, then I have a problem doing my job in healthcare. <laughs> that it's not possible to change your sex and if you're going to address people's needs, then you need to be frank with them. But apparently that is now a criminal activity. <sighs> Me doing my job is, is a bad thing. And one thing that I noticed, and you know, when J.K. Rowling put up the list of those uh, 10 men uh, who all sort of identify as trans women, and this doesn't obviously apply to uh, all people with gender dysphoria, I'm hoping far from it. But the, the, the 10 she put up, there were incidents uh, among those who are men who have committed pretty heinous sexual crimes. And what I don't understand is why these people, men who are committing heinous sexual crimes, some of which include paedophiles, are being given a sort of uh, enhanced status, a sort of vulnerability and a victimhood that they must be protected. And the people who are their victims, women, especially young ones, minors, are the ones in the firing line with this policy. Yeah, some of those individuals have been threatening to women like me who disagree with the government's position. And um, there, there's some people that actively pursue us. And you could say that that was criminal behaviour, but apparently that's really not a problem. It's, um, it's unfortunate because the, the, the government has taken advice from these, these people who are not experts. 
they don't understand legislation, they don't understand the law, they don't understand the implications of health and society and to women. And um, they've created a bit of a mess. And the, the, the problem that the government have, I think, is that the, the women in particular, there's a lot of us that are just not going to accept it. We're completely prepared to be <laughs> the cause of civil unrest in order to have this unpicked because it's dangerous. Mm. Uh, Elaine, uh, this law uh, rails against stirring up hatred based on race, sexual orientation and religion. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that women are not protected in this law? Why do you think women were uh, extracted from this law? I mean, they say, oh, we're going to bring in a misogyny law later. I'll believe that when I see it. What is going on here? This, is, this feeds into, in my view, the calling of women people with cervixes, people who may menstruate, all of that. Why are they trying to take womanhood away from women? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't understand why they have done this, but I agree with you that the wording of the legislation and the, the loss of words to describe women and what we are and what we need is, is deeply troubling. Um, there's lots of evidence that if you don't use the word women in health promotion, then... There's women that have got English as a second language, who've got learning disabilities, who've got dyslexia, that don't then recognise the need for them to go for, example, cervical screening. And women can die of undetected cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. There's lots and lots of evidence that this is excluding women, particularly marginalised women, from accessing all of the things that a civilised society would provide for these people. So I'm afraid I can't answer your question because it makes absolutely no sense. Well, you sort Anybody of do answer it, Elaine. You do sense. answer it. You said earlier, Elaine, just before you go, uh, that you work in uh, the medical field. What do you do? I'm a physiotherapist. I'm a pelvic health physiotherapist. Oh, OK. I mean, it's so, so people ridiculous. That have had, yeah. People that have had... Um, um, treatment from gender clinics can land up in our clinics because of the complications uh -huh. that they, they, they experience from the unwanted um, it's so, secondary It's so effects. ridiculous that people like yeah. you uh, are, in a way, being prevented from treating patients properly because you're not allowed to classify them as a woman. And, by the way, last point, a couple of years back uh, when the NHS took to calling women people with cervixes, loads of women didn't realise that referred to them and didn't get cervical checks. So uh, that's where we head when we do this sort of nonsense. Uh, Elaine, great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Uh, coming Thank up... You. Uh, oh, no, it's you, uh, Alex. Oh. Coming up after the break, <laughs> sources claim Princess Kate rushed the announcement of her cancer battle over fears her medical details were about to leak. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, according to a palace source, the Princess of Wales was forced to release the video announcing her cancer treatment because her diagnosis was about to be leaked. Uh, the source of the leak is unknown, but there is speculation it may have come from the London clinic where she had her surgery. Uh, last month, police launched an investigation into whether hospital staff attempted to access Kate's private medical records. And we're still joined in the studio by political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister. Yeah, so we saw Kate's uh, brave announcement a couple of Fridays ago, uh, which was a really sort of totemic moment, I think, in royal history. It certainly put pay to some of the absurd... Uh, consp and hurtful conspiracy yeah. theories that were spiralling around the world. Uh, but uh, now, and I thought that was a good moment. I always thought she should have told us a little bit more. People don't like me for that, but I'm a journalist. I want to know stuff. Uh, and she was forced... What I, what I find uncomfortable about this, and I, I really do not condone this, was that if this is true, this story, no reason to disbelieve, it's in the mail today, we heard about these people... Uh, who tried to access her medical records. It looks as if the palace feared that her private medical cancer details mm. had been compromised and they would be leaked, probably not in this country, but probably in America or something, and therefore they felt they had to launch a preemptive strike with her speech. Now, I'm very uncomfortable about the fact that a young mum suffering from cancer was forced mm. into doing this. Mm. That's not right. I feel... Um... So sorry for the princess. Yeah. I think this is utterly contemptible that whoever it is who was planning to leak this information, um, the, the most serious consequences sh should hit them. And I think, actually, you, you, you're right there, Kev, when you talk about how it wouldn't be the British press, whoever, whoever was planning to leak this information, they could have gone to every single paper on Fleet Street yeah, and they would have yeah. all shut the door in their faces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the problem is they would just go to America, yeah absolutely be able to sell this for mega books over there and it would filter back through social right. media so the palace had no if, the, if this is right the palace had no option really but mm. to act i think i've always felt very um very strongly that the palace press operation let the princess down uh, from the start of this because obviously once that doctor opened the floodgates to all these conspiracy theories and that was a real misstep there but Regardless of that, no woman, whether they are a prince or a pauper, should be forced to, forced to do yeah. talk about their personal health situation because somebody else is accessing their medical but records and leaking it. There were plenty of people out there who, in many respects, have blood on their hands about this. Yeah. There were people in the mainstream media, yeah. there were people in international media, there were big celebrities, there were talk show hosts, there were influencers online, then there was Joe Public going down the conspiracy theory wormhole. Everybody who joined that yeah. whole chorus yeah, yeah. was essentially commodifying this woman's suffering to the extent that someone working in a hospital thinks, I could make loads of money from getting those records. But I do think this is going to have a huge back 
backlash on the hospital, yeah. on the London Clinic, because it's got a big international marketplace. It is yeah. a big private hospital on Harley Street, world renowned. If I was the King of Jordan or whatever, and thought, well, I might go there for some surgery, I'm not picking it now. No. And I think facing a potential £17 million pound fine, by the way. Right. So it could be, it could so. be an, uh, so. an existential so problem. Yeah, though. rightly so, because... I think the, the reason the royals, you know, choose certain hospitals, this hospital, is because of the level of trust required. Um, and obviously we've seen with the king as well, you know, he's, he's been treated at the same place. And I think it, it, once that trust is gone, I mean, yeah. it, it really is, mm. where, where do they go right. now? They, they don't have alternatives, really. They can't pop to the local NHS hospital. Let's, let's be clear about it. Um, and I think it's really sad that they now have to kind of contend with not only battling with yeah. uh, a serious illness, um, but also knowing who can but who can I trust about know, this? Without sounding like, you know, banging the drum for the Me Too movement uh, after sort of, you know, my outpouring of uh, feelings over what's going on in Scotland, it's it, really important that the King also came out at the same time, went into hospital at the same time yeah. as Kate and came out and said, I've got cancer at the same yeah. time as Kate. Because it has offered her some protection, but it's also, I think, really exposed the fact that he's an older man yeah. and he's not being treated in no. the same way. People aren't, they're going, what sort of cancer is it? How long has he got to live? Yeah. Sort of treatments he having is he going to lose his hair with kate that was it it was yeah. like you know everyone just piling in on her and i think it's very reflective over the way that women in the public eye are treated differently to men yeah i think there is women make better copy than men no, so they they yeah. simple as no, that they do. They and, do. and people just yeah. are more naturally interested and also because women are more interested than men they just <laughs> well, are there is that. they just, yeah, they, they just are and i think because there's actually such affection for the princess mm. i mean there really is deep affection she's played a, a kind of really crucial role in modernising the monarchy mm. uh, and she's a kind of fresh face and I think because of that people are just naturally really interested and also because people were worried she's she's a young mom yeah, and she's got two yeah. young kids mm. and, and so it's natural that people are interested in it yeah. but just it, to, it just went too far. Just to cut the palace uh, communications office some slack to be fair to them of course the the doctored photograph was a disaster they yeah. should never have done that big mistake however and i was criticizing them a lot uh, during that period saying come on we need more information here to be fair uh, both kate and the communications office at the palace uh they they uh, held their council because they wanted to wait until the end of school term so that when uh, kate made that announcement she could be with the kids and explain it to them so to be fair there yeah. was a reason for that rather protracted delay yeah. and it's a reason we should all sympathize with. yeah absolutely i think all, although i would point out that in the kind of vacuum before that there was so much horrible speculation on social media that you do wonder if, if any of that filtered back to the children anyway, because when they're in school and their school cards oh, yeah, have got phones, it, it's really hard. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think there really was a kind of good option in this, mm. but I think the, the, the photo definitely was a bad That was move. a bad idea. But other than that, I think it was very difficult to work out a good timing for all this. Talking about commodifying other people's suffering, a nice segue there into the energy Terrible companies. <laughs> no, I think it's a decent enough segue. <laughs> you know, let's profit from suffering, so, so say the, the energy not. companies. <laughs> No, but look, it, okay, it's, the energy giants have pocketed 420 yeah. billion in profits over the last four years when everyone else is struggling to even boil their kettle. Now, we all understand how this works. And if you start getting a bit, you know, excitable about windfall taxes mm. and this, that and the other, you actually end up scaring away enterprise and industry. And of course, this is good news for uh, lots of people's pensions who are invested yeah. as shareholders in these energy companies. But it does smack as something, I think, to a lot of people around the country. Yeah. And they're saying, my God. Goodness, my energy bill is astronomical. It's eye-watering. Over winter, I was worrying about whether I could even put the central heating on. And this £420 billion in profits, none of that has really even been used for us, the yeah. ordinary people who are the consumers. And I think it, it, it will stick in consumers' throats. If you've got a smart meter, I've had to, had to hide mine because it was just too awful watching it tick Problematic. around. Um, <laughs> so I've stuck it behind the sofa. Um, but I think also, if you are um, somebody on low pay, or low income, uh, and you have really been struggling over a cold winter to heat your home, this just actually makes you feel quite sick. And I think there's a big problem with the energy companies in that standing charges are a huge, huge problem for people on low incomes because you can turn mm -hmm. off your uh, central heating, you can turn off the fire, you can turn off every appliance in your house, but you still have a minimum to pay every day. Yeah. That totals hundreds of pounds a year. And that is something that I think if they wanted to kind of make yeah. peace with the public mm. after this difficult period of high prices, they would look again at those standing charges because they really hit the lowest paid hardest. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. Want, I want these companies to make profits. I want them to make big profits. Mm. But frankly, they're making obscene yeah. profits when ordinary people are uh, struggling to pay these bills. So somewhere in the middle is a, is a sensible but capitalist compromise. what is so compromise. crazy? Absolutely. It's a solution from the left wing and then eventually our government. Was I know, the government must pay people to help pay their energy bills. So everyone got this winter fuel allowance, whatever it was, the, 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 the support payment from the government. It's not from the government, that's from us. Yeah. That is yeah. us paying us. Yeah. It's a closed loop. Yeah, it makes no sense, does it? And I guess it's kind of like a bit of a redistribution, but actually it's not really, because as you say, we all got Everyone it. Everyone got it. So, so I so paid it in paid and I got it out. paid the tax and got it out. Yeah. It's us paying it us. No it was just a, yeah, yeah, it was a smoke and mirrors, that. Yeah, let's go Nonsense. back to the migrant crisis, shall we? 800 migrants came across over the Easter weekend. Uh, I can exclusively reveal they've just released the figures for the number of migrants that crossed the channel yesterday. Ooh. Guess how many that was? Go on. Zero. So none came across yesterday. So 800 came across Friday, Saturday and Sunday. That is a lot of migrants. Wow. For some reason, I've noticed this. It, they come in waves. Yeah. I mean, if I can use that analogy. <laughs> they come uh, on that, so, so you'll get three or four days where loads of them come across. Yeah. And then there'll be a couple of dormant days and then they'll resume. Uh, but 800 yeah. migrants in three days. I mean, this is uh, the oldest story in the book, but it gets worse and worse and worse for that prime minister of ours who, unless we forget, promised, I will stop the boat. I, I uh, hot-footed it over here from uh, a briefing at Downing Street this morning mm. where I asked, is the prime minister still confident he will stop the boats? And the answer came back, yes. Oh, God, oh, <laughs> really? So, really? So I said, well, look, you know, we've had these record numbers. Last year, obviously, the numbers went down. Uh, already this year, we've got huge numbers. What's, what's the answer to that? And it was a mixture of different things. But one of the uh, suggestions was the weather. Um, <laughs> the other suggestion was um, that the this increasing aggression on the French beaches Ooh. from migrants towards the French authorities. I, see. I don't quite know what that means. If the French police are just saying, fine, well, that's you sort go. of what they've been saying, isn't yeah. it? I mean, not necessarily yeah. due yeah. to aggression. So, Just off you go. Oh, yeah. you're leaving France, it's you're like, going to Britain. Good, like bye! When you allow criminality to continue, the criminals become emboldened. You'll be pleased to know, though, that our uh, UK Border Force catamarans were out in force, uh, bringing scores of people to shore in Dover, you know, because that's what they do. Taxi the, service. The, the actually named Border Force catamaran Defender. <laughs> Defender. Defender. Uh, I mean, it's a taxi it. service, isn't it? They are in LI. Uh, they are a taxi service. The Border Force, they are a taxi service. We're picking these people up two I, miles from know, the Calais I coast. Know I, want to, I want to sort of, you know, go across in some sort of jet ski with, you know, bags of cocaine on my head and see what Defender does then. If that also picks me and says, oh, come bags on. Bags of cocaine on <laughs> your <Come> head. <laughs> There's another one of those head-based <laughs> cocaine smugglers. A <laughs> well-known tactic for sneaking in. Yeah. No, Don't go into the drug smuggling. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like you'll be useless. Yeah, I think, um, well, no, I think UK Border Force <laughs> Defender would just be like, come on in, something illegal. We love that here. Go but, to a hotel. <laughs> but it is a real problem, isn't it? I mean, look, you know, I mean, I, I took a panel of uh, express readers into number 10 recently, and obviously migration was top of the list of their concerns. One of the things they kept saying to the PM was, look, why can't we just actually turn the boats yeah, around? Right. Why? His, his answer, and I, and I actually agree with him on this, I think this is fair enough, is he says the people smugglers put people on such flimsy boats mm -hmm. that if you turn them around, they're going to collapse and die. Oh, yeah, but wait a minute, take them, Pick them up and take them back oh, wait, there. Look, I've got, I've got, I've got, uh, I, keep, I keep making this point, right? You get to the middle of the channel, yeah. right? And that's when the, the British taxi service starts picking yeah. them all up. And they go, we can't turn the boats around, it could be lethal. So it's OK to take them that way towards Dover. That's not lethal. <laughs> but if you just turn them around and take them back towards Cali, that's Cali, lethal. That's lethal. <laughs> This is a uh, one line of BS we're getting here. <laughs> you know, I'll tell I, you. It's going to get to the stage, like I said, there'll be some sort of insurrection. The fishermen of uh, Ryan Dover will be taking their own boats out and dragging these people back to France it's because a, it's, it's a, just getting stupid. It, it, now. It's a big problem. And for the Prime Minister, everything rests on this now. The, the economy seems to be uh, on, on the kind of up. Uh, let's hope it's, it stays that way. But so for, he, he's, everything is about Rwanda now. And if he does not get that plane in the air, Pretty yeah, quick. Also, There'll be no one on that plane. You get the plane in the air 
Uh, maximum they'll get 200 of them out there over yeah. the yeah. next That's few like months. Days that will not deter a single person from yeah. crossing the yeah. English uh, Channel. Uh, I mean, Rishi Sunak is in cloud cuckoo land. I don't know what Murphy thinks he's thinking. Well, I think they look at the, what happened with Albania, and obviously there's huge numbers of Albanians coming across. They did a deal. It's a deal. Yeah. It's not the same as saying you'll go to Rwanda, is it? No, it, it isn't. And obviously it's a different scale. Yeah. But they point out that actually that did stop them people from Albania trying to cross the channel because they knew yeah. that they would get sent One back. One country down, about 500 <laughs> to go. Yeah. This yeah. Is a, it's a game of whack-a-mole, yeah, isn't it? it? Is, and, it you is. know, for, for any government, it's going to be a nightmare trying it's to sort this out. It's going to sink soon, that. It really will. Now, on that note, coming up after the break, BBC staff are reportedly becoming increasingly frustrated over the ongoing Hugh Edwards scandal with the former newsreader set to be named amongst the broadcaster's highest earners, despite being suspended after an investigation into his alleged behaviour continues. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to was moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, BBC News presenter Hugh Edwards, who currently doesn't read the news, is set to be named as the BBC's highest paid newsreader. Edwards is said to be too mentally unwell to take part in a BBC investigation into his alleged behaviour, though there appears to be a distinct lack of sympathy on the part of his frustrated colleagues, with one senior presenter labelling his continued pay package as, quote, 
immoral. We're still, of course, joined by Sam Lister, editor, political editor at The Daily Express. I mean, this is balmy, isn't mm. it? The accusations against Hugh Edwards are pretty serious in nature. I'd imagine if that sort of spills into the public domain, as it has done, and you realise that your beloved career that you've built over many years is for the chop, you probably would have a bit of a mental breakdown. But that doesn't excuse the fact that he's raking in almost half a million pounds to not do his job because he's embroiled in a sex scandal. And this is, I mean, we always we have to remember, this is our money, isn't it? We all right. have to pay yep. this. So it's, it's us who are funding this huge wage uh, for their biggest newsreader star, who, as we know, has not been on screen for, for the it's best part year of now. a year. It's a year now. Yeah. So I think, obviously, there are always kind of employment laws that have to be uh, considerations to his mental health. I'm sure he is in a terrible way, actually. <laughs> I think it's probably been uh, really quite traumatic for him um, to see this fall from grace happen. But that doesn't mean we should have to keep funding his salary. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah he, also, that's good karma. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, well, you know, uh, we don't know what his... We don't even know if he's denying all of these allegations mm. because this investigation hasn't happened mm. because he's not available to be investigated because he says he's suffering from mental health issues. I mean, how many uh, years does that go yeah, on? Well, the right. tribunals, industrial tribunals, yeah. uh, do have a cut-off point. In the end, they will say, well, enough is enough because, to be fair to the BBC, they should be investigating this, they should be getting this out of the way as swiftly mm -hmm. as possible because, as you say, mm. it's public money. Mm. Also, the staff are furious, £440,000 for someone who's not doing his job for a year. Uh, so tribunals have got a history of, a, at a certain point, will say, enough is enough. Either this guy is investigated or he has to go. But the BBC, the state broadcaster, cannot carry on kicking this can down the road, can they? No, and I think, actually, junior staff at the BBC are really not paid exactly. awfully big amounts mm. of money. They're on reasonably low uh, salary. Ten times less than uh, that. Exactly. Like I mean, they're, they're nowhere grand, near, yeah. you know. So for them to have to see... Uh, this back in the news again uh, when they're on mm. much lower salaries is quite galling. Uh, also, I mean, you know, there's been reports in the press in the last week about uh, a very popular BBC comedy that uh, is no longer being recommissioned despite mm. having really good healthy viewing figures because they can't afford to make it. They are um, slashing all kinds of uh, schedules on the radio, uh, getting rid of shows that actually people find uh, very... Uh, you know, popular, they are getting rid of all these things because they don't have enough money. Yeah. Yet here they are paying this huge amount of money <clears throat> to somebody who is no longer on screen. It, it also suggests to me that there's some sort of hierarchy of the criminality of crimes, because I'm pretty sure if this was somebody else and not one of the BBC's beloveds, yeah. and it had been a, a, basically oh an beloved. identical <laughs> crime but in slightly different circumstances, they would be hung out to dry. Yeah. But instead, because it's Hugh Edwards and the, the nature of what he has uh, been accused of doing, it's, oh, poor Hugh, he must have got a bit old and had a funny term. Yeah. I don't know. It seems to be that it's being excused when actually the severity of the accusations are, are pretty strong. If it, was some, if it was somebody, a junior member of staff, they, they will be right. long gone. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that's a suspicion, And I think we it? should stress that uh, Hugh Edwards, we don't even know whether he denies these no, no. allegations. No. Uh, uh, but he's accused of inappropriate relationships with younger members of staff. We don't even know if it's got to the point of him denying it, but the BBC have got to get their skates on there because this is turning into an embarrassment. I mean, that's it. I mean, we don't know what he's done or hasn't done. We don't know if he denies it, if he admits it or, or, or anything like that. But what we do know is he hasn't been on screen for the best part of a year and he's still being paid. Right. And that is a problem. A £440,000 a year for doing right. nothing under any circumstances. It bears uh, thinking about, that doesn't it, to say that the is, least. Basically, that is post-tax in yeah. one month what yeah. most people get in a year. Keep, apparently, the BBC keep going back to him. Oh, I'm still too ill. Well, I think the BBC is going to say, come on, you, yeah. time to face the music. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about the Union Jack, uh, the Sun newspaper today, uh, all over the front page is Union Joke. This, of course, follows last week when we learned to our horror that the England uh, football squad uh, strip on the back of their collar has got a St George's cross that's all sort of pink and green and blue and whatever. And everybody's going, well, why don't you do the St George's cross, which is red and white, of course. And now we learn that Team GB, the Olympic team, are going to go uh, to the Olympics bedecked in, I don't it's supposed to be a union jacket. It looks what like, that? Sort looks of like really a really bad car. granny's wallpaper or something. <laughs> I mean... I think... 
you just have to look at other countries. Would other, can you imagine France doing this or yeah, Ireland or, you know, uh, <clears throat> India? I mean, the, the flag is there for a reason. It's sustained for hundreds of years for a reason. Uh, it's an iconic design for a reason. Yeah. And so who are, who are these people to come along and mess around with it who think they know best? I think most people just think the flag, particularly if it's a, sp a sporting event and we all, all want to get behind the national team, we want the national flag. Yeah, I mean, also, they, they, they constantly, all these sort of woke people who need to introduce a diverse d design constantly reach for the pink pantones, don't they? Putting the GB into LGBTQ, woo. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it goes too far. A flag is a flag. It doesn't need to be diverse because it doesn't represent anything other than marking that this is the country. This is a nation This is a country, is a country and yeah. it is straight and white. No, it's just this is the country. This is the country, Done. absolutely. Stop screwing, Stop screwing with our flag. Stop screwing with our flag. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Why? Why, why are you doing this? Now, oh. meanwhile, over in <laughs> Germany, you can buy the uh, national football kits as well. Uh, one of the numbers, you got the numbers on the back, one of the numbers is 44. You can't get it anymore because it looks like the SS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Bad day at the office for whoever designed that one, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, you just wonder what goes on at these places. I mean, who was it at Nike? Do you remember what Nike said about the St George's Cross? It's a playful reimagining of the St George's Cross. <laughs> What's this, a playful oh, reimagining of the St George's Cross? A playful re 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 the, the funny side of the Nazi regime or something like that. You know? Well, a light-hearted take, yeah. you know, <laughs> some no, years on. A light-hearted take on what the is, SS. What is balmy is you, you can get these shirts customised, right? So you can say, I want whatever number on yeah. the back is my lucky number. I mean, 44 isn't normally in a football team, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, so what they've actually turned around and done now is said, right, nobody can customise their shirts in case somebody decides to choose 44. <laughs> it's like, just look at this, though. Why didn't they do 44 in a different sort of typeface? Because that way it does look a bit like SS, so do it, it in a different typeface. It's unfair <laughs> to the number 44, I, I think. think. The problem is you've got all these designers who are getting paid an awful lot of money to come up with something new, when actually, if you just stick to the basics... Right. Yeah, they don't want to come and back we'll with, oh, guess what, here's a shirt with the national flag <laughs> well, as I said it. to it's Nike... Took I, I said two to, minutes to mock that one up, didn't it? My message to Nike, an American firm, if you want to playfully reimagine a flag, why don't you have the guts to reimagine your own yeah, flag? Start, 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 start with the, haven't uh, got the guts, yeah, have you? No. Haven't got the guts. Sam, uh, thank you. It's been wonderful having Sam. your company Pleasure. today. Sam Lister from the Daily Express there. Now, coming up after the break, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling has taunted Scottish police to arrest her under the nation's controversial new hate crime laws. Go on, do it. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Now coming up in this hour, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling rages at Scotland's new hate crime laws, daring officers to arrest her as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak backs Rowling's right to free speech. And the Princess of Wales reportedly <clears throat> was forced to reveal her cancer battle after Kensington Palace learned the news had possibly been leaked. And despite the wettest 18 months on record, Britain still faces the grim prospect of a hosepipe ban and water shortages this summer. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Divya Cohn. Good afternoon. Israel's Prime Minister says one of its strikes in Gaza that killed seven aid workers, including one British national, was unintentional. In a video message, Benjamin Netanyahu said this happens in war and his government will ensure it doesn't happen again. Officials in Cyprus say some ships are turning back from Gaza, carrying around 240 tonnes of undelivered aid due to the strike. Rishi Sunak says his thoughts are with the friends and families of the victims and Israel must investigate the tragedy. They're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old has died with two other school children injured after a shooting in Finland. Police were called to a primary school located north of Helsinki to reports of another child opening fire on pupils. The suspect, a minor, was detained at the scene. Locals have been told to stay away from the area with an investigation underway. The Labour Party claims conservative turmoil under Rishi Sunak has cost the taxpayer £8.2 billion and nearly a year in lost time. Labour's unveiled a website called The Cost of Chaos, which includes a bill calculating the cost of Tory by-elections, ministerial reshuffles and policy U-turns, like scrapping the northern leg of HS2. Donald Trump's avoided having his assets seized after posting a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case. The former U.S. president was at risk of having prime real estate like Trump Tower and Mar-a-Lago estate taken away from him. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. The number of patients waiting more than four weeks to see their doctor has risen by 30% to 17.6 million. The British Social Attitude Survey also found less than a quarter of people were satisfied with GP services, the lowest level up recorded since 1983. GPs have come under growing strain after the COVID pandemic and ongoing NHS strike action. Dr Lawrence Gerlis, a GP at Same Day Doctor, told Talk TV the system isn't working. As you say, waiting a month to get in to see a GP. Look, it's Tuesday today. I've been working all weekend. My local GP practice, who I tried to contact on Thursday, has been closed all weekend. That's their contract. That They're not contracted to be open bank holidays and weekends. So where do people go? 
and an eight-year-old man has been arrested at Heathrow Airport after 27 years on the run. Richard Burrows was captured by police on Thursday after returning to the UK from Thailand. Extensive appeals were made by detectives to find Burrows after he failed to attend the start of his trial over alleged child sex offences at Chester Crown Court in 1997. He now faces 11 counts of indecent assault and two of a serious sexual offence. That's the latest weather time now with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. There will be some sunshine today, but top and tail of the country, there'll be some rain. We've got cold, uh, cold weather across eastern Scotland with outbreaks of rain this afternoon in the south. We've got this next veil of cloud heading in to bring some really soggy weather to end the day across much of southern England and south Wales. And you can see that also approaching uh, quite quickly this afternoon with freshening winds. In between, yes, some milder, sunnier spells, but there will be a few showers dotted about. Highest temperatures in the south and east at 13 to 17 degrees, just about possible. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, it stays wet and cold in the northeast, a bit of snow for Grampian. Across the south, we've got that wet weather continuing to push its way northwards across more central areas. It'll be heavy and persistent and get some tricky driving conditions as well. A lot of mist and murk over the hills as well, not particularly pleasant. It does turn a bit drier by the end of the night and quite mild for most, just a bit of frost in the far north of Scotland. And then for Wednesday, well, it's a pretty messy picture. Low pressure creeping into the Irish Sea, throwing that rain right across more central parts of the country country, heavy and thundery across some parts of northern England through the afternoon. In the south, at least some brighter spells where it will feel warmest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including uh, reports that over a third of Scottish police officers have still not been trained on their new hate crime laws, despite the regulations coming in yesterday. Also, reports that Princess Kate's hand was forced when it came to disclosing news of her cancer treatment after the news was leaked and the ludicrous news that Britain still faces a hosepipe ban and water shortages this summer, despite the wettest 18 months on record. Uh, I, I, every time I hear that, it makes me annoyed. But let's talk about the BBC. Uh, we've covered mm. uh, um, uh, Hugh Edwards, who's on £440,000 a year, despite having not done a minute's work for the past <laughs> year, uh, pending an investigation to alleged uh, inappropriate relationships with younger members of staff. We don't even know if he denies that. But my point is, he gets £440,000 as the highest paid newsreader. Have a look down on that list. <clears throat> this list will be published in July. It's all the highest paid earners and it'll be full of sort of news readers that you've barely heard of on £220,000 a year, £180,000 a year. They are taking our money at the BBC and dividing it among themselves. In yeah, the, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, old yeah, days, yeah. the robber barons used to steal taxes off the peasants uh, for their land. Mm. Uh, now, uh, the robber barons, they work for organisations like the BBC who make us pay them so yeah. they can divide this money. No one else gets £440,000 to read the news in the entire British television industry. Why does the BBC pay people so much? Well, it's mad, isn't it? I remember my time at the BBC. Oh, I remember that well. Gave me PTSD, that did. Yeah. Um, and I was basically, ironically, on a zero-hours contract for like a tuppence an hour. Um, it was harrowing. <laughs> And, you know, it was a dreadful job, which is why I left, basically, because it was just yeah. utterly appalling. But what you did notice at the BBC, because I'd come from commercial television, ITV, was ITV. They just made a lot more good content with a lot less stuff yeah, yeah. in the news. It's like, right, take a cameraman, off you go, yeah. edit your own material, come back, you know, be an adult, be a proper journalist, get it done. At the BBC, it's like, right, we need to get a clip to go with this story. Let's get the presenter to go stand on a motorway bridge. Let's send three junior producers out to get a clip with the First Minister. Let's have another junior producer sitting in an editing suite with a craft editor cutting 15 seconds. One person can do that all by themselves. Mm -hmm. The waste at the BBC, the profligate waste for people who have worked inside it and seen it with their own eyes is something to behold. But also, a big problem that the BBC seems to have, probably true, I think, in other, in, uh, in other uh, sections of our industry, is when you get these sort of big name stars, the talent, 
They're yes. beatified. Yes. You know, they can do no wrong. Oh, better not investigate them. They walk on water. Aren't they magical? See where they go. Look at everything yeah. they touch turning to gold. Yeah. The, no. talent, the talent. The they talent. They speak into microphones. Can you imagine having that amount of talent? <laughs> uh, you're right. They are. They can read. They, 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 they're treated like gods. Yeah. And when I made that point earlier about how highly paid, overpaid these newsreaders in particular are, who just read auto cues like we do, and we don't get what uh, yeah. Hugh Edwards earns, trust me. Gary Lineker gets 1.3 yeah, Gary million Lineker for reading point... football scores. Yeah. Now, uh, Why? But, but what we should point out is what you quite rightly alluded to is while Hugh Edwards is getting £440,000 a year, this was back, mm. way back when, when he used to actually turn up for work, uh, his <laughs> producer probably on 10 times less than that, yeah. forty five grand if you're lucky. Yeah. So the disparity between what the BBC sycophantically, <clears throat> ridiculously and ludicrously calls the talent and people who actually do the work the producers, the assistant producers, the people who put the programmes together, the disparity is grotesque. Yeah, no, it's it grotesque. really, really is. I mean, you see this in a lot of different industries, uh, frankly, that those at the top are increasingly being paid multiples of what those at the bottom are being paid. But there is something about our industry which does do it to a sort of utterly, you know, horrifying, jaw-dropping extent. But the BBC always says, oh, well, we have to pay people like Hugh Evans all this money because of the commercial rivals will right. we'll poach them otherwise. The commercial rivals won't pay any Anything like what Look, you pay everyone. Talking. Where do you think Gary Lineker's going to go for 1.3 million quid a year? Uh, I know, nowhere. But talking <laughs> about people at the top being paid in sort of ludicrous multiples of those at the bottom, it's sort of another segue. We like our segues yeah, on Crosstalk. Good, good, yeah. um, but, you know, <laughs> it, it's worth pointing out the massive fat cap bonuses and salaries the chief executives of utility companies yep. get. Because there you have, you know, Joe Bigwig, whatever he's called, who's running Thames water into the ground, leaks everywhere, sewage being pumped into rivers, all the fish in one particular Oxford village are now yeah. dead and floating on the water with, like, your wrong genitalia and, like, glazed over cocaine eyes because of all the rubbish that's been pumped into that particular river. Um, and he's probably walking home with millions of pounds, isn't he, for not doing his job? Yeah. It's the same thing again. Uh, indeed. And uh, we're going to get a hosepipe van and uh, we have been asking you, uh, with a view to that, until water companies get their act together, would you put a ban on hosepipe bans? In other words, stop them banning us from using our hosepipes when they're leaking all the water, they're nicking all the money, and they're pumping sewage into our rivers and into the sea. So, with a view to that, why should we take the brunt? Would you ban hosepipe bans? <laughs> Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text us right talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222, or you can tweet us on X at talk. TV. And indeed, you have been uh, pouring in texts and tweets this lunchtime. Gordon says they've literally had decades to get their acts together, but the only thing they've managed to successfully do is line their pockets. And Ray says uh, they will never get their act together while they legally can dump raw sewage. Mm. And Colin says the only thing water companies have sorted is stuffing their pockets. Yeah, they certainly don't leak, do they? They do. Yeah, I'm part of a system that doesn't leak. leak. At all. <laughs> Uh, right, but first, back to our top story today. The Prime Minister has backed author J.K. Rowling in her criticism of the new Scottish hate crime laws, saying people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Sunak says the Tories will always protect free speech after the Harry Potter author challenged police to arrest her under the new legislation for online posts in which she called trans women men. Uh, the SNP's hate crime law, which creates a new crime of stirring up hatred related to protective characteristics uh, has come up against heavy criticism amid fears it could be used for political purposes. Scottish Minister Siobhan Brown says J.K. Rowling could be investigated by police for what she's done, but Education Secretary Gillian Keegan said police should focus on fighting crime rather than policing people's thoughts and opinions. Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald joins us in the studio now. Well, this is this has stirred up a hornet's nest in Scotland, hasn't mm. it? It really has, but not just in Scotland, here as well. And we saw that from Rishi Sunak's intervention, actually saying that he agrees with J.K. Rowling on this. Now, the issue that J.K. Rowling had specifically with, with the new legislation was that you could be criminalised for misgendering someone um, with their chosen pronouns, and that was part of this act, and that was something that J.K. Rowling said was ridiculous and would really circumvent our right to free speech, and that's what Rishi Sunak has said. 
said that the Conservatives really support and that they back. I don't think anybody understands how this is actually going to work in practice. It'll be very interesting, I think, to see whether J.K. Rowling does actually get arrested, because if she doesn't, it sends a signal to everybody that this law is utterly pointless and carry on. Uh, but if she does, it also sort of raises a question. You were joking earlier, weren't you, about if we stood one side of Hadrian's Wall and yelled over the top, Oi there! You're a bloke, you're, you're a bloke. You're, you're a bloke. <laughs> but then actually, technically, we're coming out of people's television screens in Scotland, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Ooh, does that mean we're Arrest me be... now, arrest me. Yeah, how does it work? Well, this is it. Like, the, the logistical part of it is not really clear or coherent whatsoever. It's such a hard thing to police. It's such a hard thing to tackle. And we've seen that over the years with social media as well, in, where there are laws in place on things you can and can't do. Um, with various types of cyberbullying and sexual harassment, for example, it's been really hard for police to actually crack down on it and find out, A, who the culprit is, or B, work out what that specific line is and where someone actually does cross it. So there's a lot to actually be done before this law can actually be put in place in an effective manner. And I think that's another thing that people take mm, issue and, with and, about and it. Are there, are there sort of cries of despair over the fact that this law actually uh, makes a set, telling the truth, saying the truth, illegal. Right. But uh, if you tell a lie, that's lawful. In other words, a trans woman uh, is not a man. A trans woman is a trans woman. It's not biologically a man, isn't a man. But if you say that in Scotland, that's against the law. Uh, if you say a trans woman is biologically a female, that's lawful, but it's not true. Well, this is it, and that's the the, the hard sorry, punch here of my water. <laughs> yeah. We're getting really worked up about this. So I've up. had enough of this. <laughs> this is why we call it cross talk. Yeah. Everyone's just has to be really The is infectious, I'll tell you. <laughs> Get Tim's like psyching yeah. everyone up Join before we come in. Doing this night show, hate speech. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. it. That's a good do idea. <laughs> um, well, I don't remember. No, no, no. I mean. <laughs> Uh, are people questioning the legitimacy of this law yeah. that makes it illegal to tell the truth? Well, absolutely, and that's that's why it's so divisive, because there are people on that side of the argument who just say this is simple, um, you know, common sense, this is just a case of free speech, and, you know, people are allowed, being allowed to just speak what they say is the truth. But then people who feel very strongly on the other side as well, who say that this is discrimination to, to, to speak that way in this modern day society. And we have to remember that that argument is quite prevalent in society today as well. So that's what's making this quite so divisive and so heated. It's not quite as easy as just to say that, you know, this is the truth and this isn't. For lots of people, they don't consider that the case. Yeah, I mean, it does sort of strike me as oh, absolutely balmy that, you know, you can have a rule so authoritarian in Scotland. It strikes me balmy that you can have this level of an authoritarian rule in the first place, but then doesn't apply, you know, literally half, you know, if you crossed over the border and stood at, you know, the end of Berwick-upon-Tweed, it doesn't apply there. Well, this is it as well. And th that's the trouble, I guess, with devolution in general. So the idea that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland can have some responsibilities themselves and make their own laws is really good in so many ways, but local issues, um, things that, that just don't need to come out of Westminster. But something like this, it's a lot bigger than that. It's a lot broader. Mm. And it's hard to say, you know, does someone who is living in Scotland and says something that, that comes um, against this law, do they get arrested? But then someone outside of Scotland says it to someone to, mm. who is in Scotland. I mean, like, how on earth do you do you work that out when it's just the case of a, so a border? Whole Scottish families going to sort of the south of Berwick-upon-Tweed for some sort of communal catharsis to stand there and vent their dislike of things. Uh, and I just think it puts uh, devolution in the mm. dock. I mean, there's yeah. something dysfunctional about the fact Scotland can pass this law and then the Prime Minister of the whole country, including Scotland, said this is a pile of rubbish <laughs> uh, and uh, it's ridiculous that people should be expected to obey it. Mm. I mean, there's something dysfunctional <clears throat> about that. Yeah. There is. And I think the other issue with it is that lots of people are just saying, is this the priority right now? I mean, we're in quite a poor political place at the moment. And just as, as a nation in general, there's so many issues that need fixing and like mm. re very, very quickly too. And lots of people are just saying, is this the priority? Firstly, for the police. Should they be policing this over other issues when they are already so under-resourced? And secondly, just for parliamentary time as well, this law got passed really, really quickly. And there are so many other things that people might suggest would take precedent. And uh, can I ask you ladies what you feel about the fact that women are not uh, uh, included in this law? Uh, all well, these protected <laughs> uh, species like uh, trans people, they're all in there. Uh, sexual orientation, religion, uh, disability. 
uh, transgender identity, intersex, all that is yeah. in there, but there's no protection for women. Well, now, they say, oh, we will bring in a misogyny law. I'll believe that when I see it. I think this law is disgustingly sexist. Well, I, you know, what I would say on this is I defend anybody's right to call me a blonde bimbo, an ugly old crone, a slapper, whatever. You know, go for it. That is your right to do it. But that, that means old. I get to say... <laughs> You're not uh, that old. Thank you, darling. Uh, <laughs> but that means I get to say when I see some bearded Derek with his lunchbox on show wearing a dress... You're not a woman. Yeah, no, well, no, of course. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. Old slapper, that's a good one. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I've heard that one before. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, moving on, joining us now is columnist. <laughs> it's a mad nice show thing. today. We've got absolutely you have. There's a, There he is, uh, the one and only Brian Monteith, columnist at the Scottish Herald. Do you know, Brian, we've all gone balmy, so just take the floor, vent. What do you think about this legislation? Well, obviously, I'm a kind of slapper myself, <laughs> um, so you can call me that if you wish. Uh, the, the, what's going on here is clearly... Uh, the belief in the uh, Scottish Parliament in Holyrood that because we have Scots law and it's separate uh, from uh, uh, English law and UK law, uh, which are distinctly uh, different from Scots law, that they can make uh, laws like this and impose them uh, on, on Scots. But of course, uh, there is such a grey area in what has been published uh, and passed and is now enacted and enforced that uh, it is possible, it is possible that uh, were some keyboard warriors to say some things uh, on a on a blog uh, uh, from Berkshire, uh, that uh, if it particularly uh, was offensive to people in Scotland and they opened and read that blog, then then if it if it is is said in in council opinion, uh, if it was extreme enough, then charges could be brought. So it doesn't stop at the border. Uh, it's it's believed there is in fact. Uh, uh, examples of of uh, of law laws being used beyond the jurisdiction they're set in, and uh, social media is, is is an example of that. Uh, so uh, I think it's quite right for Rishi Sunak to come in and say uh, that he, he supports J.K. Rowling uh, uh, in 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 her belief that she can say what she wants um, and to test. Test the situation because this law is so vague; it needs tested, and I think people are inviting uh, it to be tested uh, in the hope that, in the end, it may be thrown out. Uh, Brian, what exactly, in your view, is going on in Hamza Yousaf's mind? Does he think this law is somehow enlightened and liberal and modern and forward-looking and, you know, makes life wonderful for everyone? Or does he, like the rest of us, even vaguely realise this is arguably the most sinister, uh, repressive law to ever be passed in this country, in these, this United Kingdom. Uh, this is a really serious assault on freedom of speech. Uh, by the way, hatred, how can you illegalise hatred? Why, why can't I hate things? What on earth does this guy think he's doing? Well, you could just as easily say, how, how could you uh, illegalise, uh, to use that word, uh, love? Uh, how can you actually make a law about emotion um, uh, and, and however sincerely uh, it, is, it is given out. Um, what I actually think uh, is this is politics. This is politics where people think they can build up uh, coalitions by identifying with different groups and giving them rights, uh, uh, retailing uh, 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 free things to them. Um, and here we have uh, a, a, a politician uh, going down identity politics, cultural wars, and saying, I will give you rights, special privileges that others won't have. I will protect you at the cost of uh, protection to other groups. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is to build up coalitions of interest, uh, in particular in winning the support, for instance, of the Green Scottish Green Party, which is a, a very uh, a, a strong supporter of this law. Um, so there are a number of people in the SNP that doubted whether this was a good idea. But as, as a coalition of going forward with the Greens, uh, this became very important. Uh, and, and, and that's why we're seeing it. Um, it's interesting, of course, that Labour backed it in Scotland. That's one of the reasons it went through so easily. Uh, and, and again, Sunak, I believe, is saying what he's saying to try and point the finger at Labour 
uh, down in England and say, would you do, do this? And, and, and if not, why don't you actually change your mind and oppose it in Scotland? Now, I know that this legislation essentially says that uh, it will criminalise threatening or abusive behaviour intended to stir up hatred against people based upon age, disability, religion, sexual or orientation or transgender ideology, as a reasonable person might consider that to be the case. What's a reasonable person, Brian? <laughs> well, we do have the previous example when, when, uh, when the SNP went down this road uh, in supporting, uh, uh, and Labour politicians too, again, uh, teaming up, uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, various songs at football matches uh, could not be sung because they were hateful songs. Uh, uh, eventually, eventually, that was uh, withdrawn, but... but Clearly, uh, football fans were able to just keep chanting away and, and provoke the police, uh, who were really in a difficult position in trying to impose that on, on large gatherings. Uh, and there were interpretations of the law where they were saying, well, actually, uh, could, could certain songs that people accept, such as uh, Rule Britannia or God Save the Queen, where does one draw the line as to whether these are offensive to people or not? Um, uh, of course, some people find them offensive uh, at, at, at the Albert Hall for the proms. So, so you know, politicians, particularly in Hollywood, have previous on this of bringing in daft laws <laughs> that actually are, are virtue signalling but cannot be made to work. Yeah, like uh, Isla Bryson, who, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, Isla Bryson's a bloke who calls himself a woman. He's a double rapist. And Nicola Sturgeon thought it was a great idea to put him into a women's jail. And basically, uh, there went Nicola's career. One last question before you go, Brian. Uh, uh, Hamza Youssef, I think, finds himself between a rock and a very hard place right now because when J.K. Rowling... Uh, returns to Scotland. She's abroad at the moment. But when she comes back, she's saying, I'm saying every single transgender woman in uh, Scotland is a bloke, is a man. Uh, that breaks your law, Hamza. What are you going to do about it? So he's damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't. If he arrests her, he's in big trouble. If he doesn't arrest her, she's going to make a mockery of his stupid law, isn't she? Well... The process would be that were uh, J.K. Rowling to repeat uh, things that people might think uh, are uh, uh, hate speech, that, that people can then complain from all sorts of different places and all sorts of different ways online and so on, and they can do it anonymously, uh, and it's their perceptions uh, that this is hateful that actually then have to be in investigated. It's, there's not a sort of uh, a set arrangement of what is uh, hateful. It's their belief it's been hateful that means that triggers an inquiry by the police. And of course, that's a perverse incentive for activists to lodge all sorts of complaints. Of uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's likely to happen, I believe, and put a huge load on the police, even before it gets to the Crown Office to decide whether a charge should be brought, which, of course, the Crown Office is independent of Yousaf, and if they don't, then he really looks stupid. What I'm a right mess. in thinking as well, Brian, just briefly, because I'm sure someone said it to us yesterday, that you're going to have these anonymised sort of Stasi-like reporting stations, and one's on a mushroom farm and another's in a sex shop. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> there you well, go. Yeah. Well, on, on that bombshell, well, Brian... You might think that if it's in a mushroom farm, that they're... Uh, in the dark, shall we say. Uh, ridiculous. Oh, uh, I'm going down the sex shop to make my complaint. <laughs> uh, Brian, uh, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Thanks, bye. Now, coming up after the break, we've had the wettest 18 months of weather since records began. But experts are warning Britain is still going to face the prospect of water shortages and hosepipe fans. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. It's a map.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the UK is facing the prospect of water shortages and host pipe bans this summer, despite the country experiencing the wettest 18 months since records began. Experts estimate 30 new reservoirs are needed to safeguard the country's water supply, but none have been built since the early 1990s. Well, joining us live is consumer expert Adrian Mills. I mean, Adrian, uh, they're, they're hardly, uh, to, to use a want of a better term, showering themselves in glory, are they, these water companies? We've had years now of lots of reported leaks not being dealt with, the whole scourge of effluent being pumped into rivers and into the sea, making a lot of the places where people want to swim uh, completely uh, unpassable. We've now got reports that half of the Cambridge boat crew from the, the boat race on Saturday have come down with lurgy after dipping their toes in the Thames. And here they are saying, well, you know, despite it being the wettest 18 months since record began, you're not allowed to water your plants this summer. It, it makes a mockery of us, doesn't it? Well, I'm afraid it does. Um, 1836 uh, was the moment that um, records more or less began. Um, and if you think about it, what is the one thing that we talk about as Brits? It's the weather. And my 93-year-old mum said to me the other day, this is probably the wettest 18 months I can ever recall in my entire life. The problem is, as you so rightly say, people have not invested in infrastructure. They've not built, as other countries have done, uh, you know, dams up in the Lake District or whatever. Uh, they've not built reservoirs. And now we throw our hands up in absolute shock and horror that there might be a problem. Well, this problem has been ongoing for probably all of my lifetime, because I can remember, you know, my dad not watering his garden, me not being able to wash the car, the host pipe ban is just almost part of the British summer. Uh, what do you think about this, though, Adrian? Uh, I think the public might have had enough 
I mean, they're looking at these stories. Uh, we're getting these water company stories far more often than we used to. We've had months of them now. And what are we talking yeah. about? We're talking about chief executives and bosses that pay themselves obscenely vast salaries. We're talking about companies that leak billions and billions of litres of water every single day and expect, expect us to kind of take the blame. Uh, and we're talking about companies mm. that pump effluent sewage into to the sea and our rivers. And then they turn around to us and they say, sorry, hose pipe ban. Now, we looked into this. Since uh, the Water Act came in 1991, no one has ever paid a fine uh, for breaking a hose pipe ban. No one. It's a £1,000 maximum fine, apparently. Uh, do you think the public might vote with their hose pipes this summer and say to the water bosses, the fat cat water bosses who are ruining our water supplies, you know what you can do with your hose pipe ban? You can stick it where the sun don't shine. Well, a lot of these bosses, you've got to remember, not only are they receiving what we would all consider to be fairly obscene salaries, but also they've all, you know, probably got their OBEs, CBEs, night hooks or whatever. So it's like a little cartel. Um, I'm not sure people will defy um, everybody um, because they're terrified that their neighbour might snitch on them. Um, and uh, you know, if you remember in America, when there was the drought, I think it was last year or two years ago during COVID, that they flew helicopters over and people that had scorched flat earth then literally you go to the next garden and there'd be this incredible green lush grass um, and that's how they were catching people and in america they were finding people now i know from places i've lived in the past that actually people have got those underground spring things that pop up at two in the morning and water the grass yeah. the little black tubes that water the gardens there's ways around it i'm not advocating it but as you so rightly say, I'm not aware of anyone that's been prosecuted. But I think people have got to the end of their tether. Cost of living crisis yeah. has been a nightmare. Now you've been told, no, let your garden go to rot. Um, it, it's, it is completely ridiculous. We are beginning to look like a third world country. Yeah, do you know, on the note of looking like a third world country, and as someone who's lived in a th uh, plenty of third world countries, actually, the one thing you never do in a third world country is trust the water. You buy it in a bottle. Uh. And I think consumers lo losing confidence in water companies is really quite big, because if they're not able to repair leaks, if they're not able to update infrastructure to make sure that they can store water in reservoirs, if they're not able to make sure that sewage isn't being pumped into rivers and into seas, how can we be sure that they're making sure the stuff that's coming out of our tap is safe to drink? I'm not saying it isn't, but if you lose trust in water companies, you need water to live. That's a pretty big deal. Well, this is what's going to be the great scandal in the future, isn't it? That, um, you know, the lack of food across the world, and I suspect water, um, you know, I find it extraordinary that we spend such a vast amount of money on bottled water, when really you should be able to turn the tap on and have full confidence that what you're getting is 100% pure. But because of the way things have worked out, as you so rightly said about the sewage, that is probably the, one of the most disgusting stories we're going to hear about. Um, and, of course, as you say, we're going to pay for it. And we're talking about not just an extra few pounds, we're talking about water bill increases of possibly 40% on top of all and every other bill that we've been forced to pay more for over this cost of living crisis. It is a scandal. But we talk about it. I want action. I want people to do something. I want the government to do something. Where are we, uh, uh, with a view to that, Adrian, where are we with these uh, apparently nearly 30 new reservoirs uh, that we <laughs> require to get our water supplies up to speed? Uh, where are we with those projects? Are we remotely building any new reservoirs? There, there are three projects going through at the moment. Uh, but, you know, this is not something, oh, well, let's build a reservoir, we'll have it sorted in the next uh, six months. They're probably, I would think, four or five years away from completion, from what I've been told. Um, and they're probably not going to be big enough to hold the capacity of water that we will need by 2050. And if you think about it, you're showing some pictures now. Obviously, as the summers get hotter, the water evaporates as well. So we see it slowly pulling back onto the shores. Um, you know, we're all being told, turn the tap off, conserve water. But then again, you know, you see other companies that actually abuse these situations. 
legislation is needed, but it's not needed for the consumer. It's needed for the suppliers. And you can't, can't bury your head in the sand. Because mm. actually, funnily enough, it will be sand if we continue down the path that we're going. Yeah, I've got an idea. Uh, <laughs> tell all the chief executives of the water companies, if your company pumps sewage into the sea or the river, you go to jail. It yeah. would stop pretty soon then. That would focus their minds on it. Yeah, it, yeah, would it, would. it would do. It would do. I should be in charge, basically, of everything. Adrian, great Work to out. talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Do you know what? I'm actually almost hoping we get, like, a Christmas election. Because <clears throat> in my head, I've just done a remix of the 12 days of Christmas, of all the things the Conservative Party have promised us. You know, 12 new hospitals, 6 yeah. new power stations, 30 new reservoirs. I think Boris... And a Prime Minister every year. I seem to remember Boris th promised us 40 new hospitals. Oh, I, I mean, have we got one yet? Oh, no. we waiting for? New prisons, new hospitals, new nuclear yeah, power stations, new reservoirs. It's just mad, isn't new it? New government. Yeah. New, yeah, new prime minister. That's yeah. the only thing they've actually been able to give us is a new prime minister every five seconds. Anyway, today we've been asking you, do we need to put a ban on hosepipe bans until the water companies sort their act out? And we have more of your texts and tweets flooding in this lunchtime. Hey, Darren well. says all councils and utilities need to be renationalised as they're not fit for purpose in the private sector. Sam says, yes, I would ban hosepipe bans entirely. Exactly, Sam. And Chelsea says, water companies only care about the shareholder. Where are the regulators these days? Uh, and Carl adds, uh, it's not solvable unless we build new towns with a new design. Otherwise, problems never get fixed and a few rich people profit from it. Interesting. Uh, now, uh, let's move on. The BBC is still paying its highest-earning newsreader, Hugh Edwards, despite the fact he hasn't been on our screens for the past eight months. Edwards was suspended by the broadcaster in July last year over allegations uncovered by The Sun that he had supposedly paid a young person £35,000 for explicit pictures. Well, according to reports, the newsreader's salary of almost £500,000 a year is expected to be published on the BBC's annual reports this summer, even though he remains suspended. Well, joining us now is campaign director at Defund the BBC, Rebecca Ryan. I mean, Rebecca, we have you on all the time to BBC bash. They make it too easy for you, don't they? <laughs> I mean, it's just gift after gift. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is an absolute joke, isn't it? That the highest paid news um, presenter or talent is has been um, missing in action for the last eight months. Yeah. I mean, it's just an absolute insult to the British people, isn't it? These people who are being bullied, 130 people a day are being prosecuted by the BBC for non-payment of the TV licence. And yet you have this top paid guy who is just actually currently refusing to take part in, a, in an investigation into this issue. So it's not even as if the, you know, an investigation has taken this long, which would be bad enough. It's just that he's not actually, you know, able to take part in it because he's too mentally unwell. Well, he was perfectly fit and well right up until the scandal broke. So yeah. it's sort of convenient, isn't it, that he's suddenly, for the, for the last eight months, unable to, to take part. I mean, it just absolutely stinks of sort of narcissism doesn't it but i mean obviously we have to wait for the, the the investigation to take place but in the meantime um it's just shocking that the, the british people are being forced to pay for this yeah we're paying for it and it's also uh, infuriating hugh's uh, colleagues at the bbc so this is four hundred and forty thousand pounds that could be shared among others we could hire someone else uh, and, uh, of course, you know, he keeps telling the BBC, I'm too ill to be investigated. Well, it's eight months on, uh, no sign of uh, any recovery soon from Mr Edwards. So the BBC, uh, for the sake of licence fee payers, for the sake of everyone else who works in BBC News, I'm afraid they've got to start getting tough with this guy and say, unless you cooperate with an investigation, we're going to have to cut our ties with you because this is frankly grotesque and it's typical of the BBC. They're just kicking the can down the road, hoping we wouldn't notice. And guess what? In July, this full list of uh, the highest paid salaries uh, in the BBC will be published and uh, Hugh Edwards' name there with 440 grand next to it is going to stick out like South End <laughs> Pier. Absolutely. And I think this thing, you can't be allowed to carry on like this, where someone is just sort of declares themselves sort of too unwell to take part in an investigation. You know, out in the real world, real people, if they get into trouble or if there's an accusation made against them, an investigation will take place regardless. And, and certainly the investigation into this 
um, should have been carried out by now. Um, you know, it's it's fairly clear that there is a, this young person involved. There will be all sorts of data on that side as well. There's enough there's enough information out there um, for people to to carry out an investigation without him taking part. So I don't see why they're not pushing ahead with this so that we can put an end to this grotesque salary being paid out to somebody who's who's just not working. It, it smacks to me as well, if we were talking about this earlier, that there is sort of a hierarchy, isn't there, within uh, the media industry, and I'd say particularly within the BBC, where if you end up being one of those lucky bods who gets to put your fizzog on screen, you're somehow turned into a deity that, you know, you can do no wrong. And the BBC protects those people, despite any sort of accusations that come from junior staff members or the general public. They crowd around those people. It's not the first time they've done this. Springing to mind, Martin Bashir, Russell Brand, of course, Jimmy Savile. It's just this is a pattern that keeps repeating itself. Absolutely. And this is the thing that's so dangerous, isn't it? Because you've got these big names, as you say, who are who become untouchable, who and, you know, we don't obviously know the full details of Hugh Edwards because this investigation is being blocked. But this is what needs to be reviewed and this needs to be changed. Because as we've seen, as you mentioned, there are a whole list of names of people who have been allowed to get away with behaviour over decades and the BBC has just protected them and closed ranks and sort of, you know, cranked up the PR machine sort of to keep business as usual. When actually what needs to happen is the BBC needs to have a complete culture change where it says, okay, hang on, there's an accusation has been made. We need to deal with this really quickly. This, these people are being paid by the British taxpayer essentially because of their current payment mechanism. It's a, it's a, it is a tax on live broadcast TV. Um, and they can't just be, they can't be um, made accountable for the behaviour of these huge beasts who are sort of like just able to, you know, <laughs> untouchable to get away with whatever they want. And it is obscene, the difference between what people like Hugh Edwards earn and what the producers and the assistant producers uh, who uh, get his programmes ready. Uh, they prepare the programmes, they do all the work. They're on, if they're lucky, 45 grand a year. He's on uh, 440 grand a year. And that is part of the culture, the rancid culture of the BBC uh, that they have to sort out. It is, as Alex said, it's this deification of anyone who reads the auto cue <laughs> on screen. Sam McAllister, <laughs> who is the uh, producer who set up the interview with uh, Prince Andrew uh, for Newsnight, uh, when she went public and said, it was me, I'm going to write a book about it, I'm going to tell everyone about what I did, the BBC hated it. They hated mm. it. Uh, they only wanted Emily Maitlis, the interviewer, to take, uh, to take mm. the uh, credit. So that's the BBC for you. They've got to do something about that. Uh, great to talk to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. As always. Now, coming up after the break, a royal source claims the Princess of Wales was forced to reveal news of her cancel battle early due to threats of a media leak. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, a royal source has suggested that Kensington Palace went public with Princess Kate's cancer battle before even breaking the news to the rest of the family so as to avoid a media leak. An insider claims the palace was contacted about Kate's diagnosis, which prompted them to get ahead of the story and record a heartfelt video message in which Kate confirmed she was undergoing preventative chemotherapy. Kensington Palace are yet to comment on the reports. Uh, joining us now is uh, Michael Cole, uh, our best friend and former BBC <laughs> Royal correspondent. Uh, welcome to the show. Yet again, Michael, always a pleasure to have hey, you on Michael. board. Uh, this is ki kind of disconcerting. You and I uh, agreed over the weeks that perhaps the Palace owed us a little bit more information than they were giving us about both the King's condition and Kate's condition. <clears throat> Subsequent facts, I think, revealed that Kate was holding on to that information while her kids were still at school. She wanted them to be on holiday when she broke the news. But this is what worries me. We also learnt that uh, two members of the staff may have tried to uh, compromise her private medical details at the London Clinic where she was being treated, where she had surgery, and that the palace feared that this information may be leaked to the press. It wouldn't have got anywhere in Britain, but it might have done OK in America. Maybe one of the tabloids over there would have run it. And uh, in view of this, Kate and the palace felt forced to make her revelation. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. I feel sorry for her in that circumstance. Now, good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Alex. Uh, you may remember, Kevin, that very soon after the Princess's broadcast, we were on air together, and I said that the broadcast may have been prompted by the allegation that there had been leaks from the London Clinic. And I think it's worth uh, examining the timeline here. The first reports in the paper, first of all, that one person at London Clinic and then three people at London Clinic had allegedly tried to access illicitly her personal information. That appeared on Wednesday the 20th. Now, if it appeared on Wednesday the 20th, you can bet your life that she knew about it beforehand. And on that very day, Wednesday the 20th, at an undisclosed location, but clearly within the grounds of uh, Windsor Castle, before a BBC camera crew, she delivered... Uh, her message, and she wrote it herself, and she delivered it perfectly. The tone was right. The words were right. And then on the Thursday, the broadcast would have been reviewed, been seen by the king, been okayed. And then on the Friday, which was the day it was broadcast, we knew, you knew, I knew, uh, a couple of hours beforehand that it was coming. We didn't know quite what it was, and it was a surprise that it was cancer. So I think it is in all likelihood true, because as you said, quite rightly, 
uh, the princess had let it be known through the usual sources that she wanted to keep this matter private as long as possible. Now, that obviously didn't happen. And then we heard uh, alternative explanations. There we see them in much, much, much happier times. The further explanation that she delayed, postponed uh, making the announcement until her children were out of school so they wouldn't be quizzed in the playground by their their uh, fellows about what was wrong with their mum. So I think in all likelihood, uh, it was that which prompted the uh, the broadcast. But what we don't know is whether the leak was the one that is alleged or the two or the three that was alleged from London Clinic or whether it came from within their own court, within their own private circle. The, the story that has appeared doesn't make that clear. Do you think now that uh, people in uh, the media, influencers, celebrities, Joe Public, who all sort of went down the wormhole of conspiracy theories and frankly were sort of circling the Kate story like vultures around carrion, are sort of abashed enough and shamefaced enough that it sort of taught us a lesson really and we'll just leave her alone from now on? Well, we didn't do it, Alex, and what you say is absolutely right. And those people should hang their heads in shame for what they did and what they said. And to be fair, one or two of them have come forward and said I was wrong because it was quite interesting. I, mean, I never, never, never look at social media ever because uh, I, I would fear that maybe I would pick up something that I would then inadvertently broadcast or write. So I never look at it. So, but I do believe that nobody had ever put forward the theory about the cancer. That just shows how wrong these people are. So if this episode has made these trolls go back in their holes, well, that's one good, one good result from it. Not much good news because this poor woman is facing cancer. And that is daunting to any woman or any person mm. at any time, particularly when she's bringing up three young children. And she has, on top of the worry of saying, how do I tell my children? How do I cope with this? I'm a busy mother. She had to face the prospect of telling the world. And she did so extremely well. And I think we can commend her for that. Uh, under duress, that's what courage is, isn't it? Uh, it, it it's performing with, uh, with uh, class uh, under pressure. And that's, there we saw it. Uh, on that Friday afternoon. Yeah, I, I suspect, I mean, I remember thinking, this is a very strange time to break this news, 6 p.m. on a Friday. <clears throat> I think yeah. now uh, we're beginning to get an explanation as to mm. why that uh, announcement was hurried out. Uh, but she did it to perfection with dignity. Yeah. And, uh, of course, really uh, our best wishes go uh, with both the Princess of Wales and the King as they battle no, cancer. Uh, Michael, a pleasure to talk to you, as always. Michael Cole there, Thanks, former Michael. BBC pleasure. Royal Correspondent. Sadly, though, Alex, it looks like we've come to the end of this Happy. show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Up next, though, is Ian Collins. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you bright and early tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out.
That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs>